It's time for Tales from the Swing with Gene and Scott Holden. The hosts of this program are not medical professionals, attorneys, accountants, or other licensed professionals and cannot give medical, legal, or tax advice. Any information or advice given by the hosts is not to be used in place of any medical, legal, tax, or financial advice or diagnosis from a qualified and licensed professional in those fields. Information provided by the hosts is intended for entertainment purposes and do not in any way constitute medical, legal, tax, or financial advice. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Tales from the Swing. This is episode 103, and we're glad to have you back. My name is Jean Holden, and right beside me is my better half. Oh, I don't know about that. Or other half, however you say it. I'm Scott Holden, everybody. (laughs) Third show. Yes. They said it wouldn't last. (laughs) We're making it to number three. So basically, um, we talk, you know, the funny side of open relationships and polyamory, all that sort of stuff. And we start out with a article in the sex news. The sexy news. The sexy, sexy news. (laughs) And then we have a guest. And then we answer questions and advice and all that sort of stuff yes. off the um our email and but then to, sometimes we read a funny ad and it's really sometimes hugely hilarious so. yeah so i'll often stop, especially <laughs> if i am ta- reading it <laughs> but this week the interview was really good it really was but went really long and yeah. this the guest today mm-hmm. that you'll be hearing in a little bit is uh, none other than... Erin Judge. And she was supposed to be our first guest, but uh, just scheduling, as we said. But she was also very happy to hear that Mike Kaplan filled the shoes. And she was pleased to find out that he did that very well. All right. So shall we uh, jump into the sexy news and play the theme and all that shit? Yes, we shall. All right, here we go. Here comes the sexy news. Hopefully I have a new theme now. week's article is about sex addiction. Ooh, so, sex addiction. Yeah. Now, I'm already is titillated. it real? Of course not. Now, therapists say maybe not. Now, I, I kind of... Ta- I believe they talked about this a little bit on education, like, right. a while ago, but okay. Right. Well, this is from USA Today, Mary Bowerman, um, and... Basically, yes. saying, uh, claiming a sex addiction may be a go-to for misbehaving celebrities <laughs> and politicians. Pretty much. But from a science perspective, there isn't enough study to prove that it's real. Um, the American Association of Sexuality educators, counselors, and therapists say that there's not, you know, there's not enough evidence to classify um, sex addiction or porn addiction as a mental disorder, which I never would think thought it was a mental disorder. Well, I mean, again, 
mental like, disorder, it, no, or is it disease, a compulsive disease? Is it like, like OCD? Alcoholism. I think it's it's. I think it's in the OCD spectrum. I think a lot of these behaviors are OCD, and that's yeah. the way. It's just sort of the mechanism they manifest. They manifest, right? Yeah, yeah. But right. so I'm in agreement. I think it is bad behavior, and also as people, it's so funny because once you kind of open up your relationship, then all those questions of sexual addiction. You know, were you a sexual addict or was it just that you had a normal sex drive and you weren't getting, you know, what your sexual lifestyle wasn't fitting your appetites right. or, and it's okay to want sex. Right. But anyway. And you, you wanted other things that, you know, just weren't available at the time. Yeah. You weren't able to. And I do think a lot of people cry, I'm an addict when they get caught do in bad behavior. Right. Because they're engaged in bad behavior for all kinds of reasons. Right. But right. That's me. That's my opinion. Yeah. I'm not. A lot of it as is. As it says at the beginning of the show, I'm not a doctor. Right. Or, a lot of it is fear. I'm you know? just a schmucky comedian. So basically. Barely. Um, the, like the AASECT, the organization I was talking about before. Says so it's sexy? Yes. Um, it says in no way saying that people don't experience real physical, psychological, and health consequences from their sexual urges. Sex addiction is an oversimplification of a complex area of human sexual behavior. I'll buy that. I'll buy that. I think. Right? That, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's like throwing it into like a yeah, I, I, jumbling I, it together. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're going to get into this a little bit with our guest. Right, right. So uh, we so, dive into it a lot deeper, yeah. actually, with her. So I appreciate this yeah, article. Yeah, it's, it's a good so article. Check it good out poll. USA Today. So. Stimulates some thoughts. It does. It's not Stimulates a, the mind. It's not, it's not quite as interesting as the, uh, as the uh, what do you call it? Our, um, shoot, um, I'm totally drawing a blank as, as it gets later in the day here. Yeah. Uh, shoot, um, uh, ag- not agnostic, but uh, shoot. Atheist. Not atheist. God. Asexuals. Sorry. Oh, asexual, yes. The A letter was stuck in my head. Yeah. That was not as... A, that. Or, yes, that yeah. was a lot more exciting. Yes. Ah. Oh. Oh. So this week, it's a pleasure to have comedian, writer, Aaron Judge. Yes, our original first guest, now our second guest, <laughs> third show. Yes. Actually, fourth show if you count the zero show, but yes. I don't know if we count that. I yes. really, I, I'm very happy with how the last show came out, by the way. It was, oh. it was a very intriguing listen, and I heard that from a couple people. So Very cool. Yes, and we didn't even have a guest, so I'm it very impressed. It was just us. Yes. <laughs> Hang, <laughs> hanging out there. Cool. So... Uh, Glad you liked it. We like it too. Yes. But this week we have a great guest and like we could probably cram like four or five shows right. with this person because like I feel like we did an hour and a half or something and we barely scratched the surface. Right. And we, she's already said she will come back. Yes. And we, we didn't even like do mm-hmm. our format of kind of asking questions and stuff. We were just kind of talking and then yeah. I guess because we we're all very on the same page. We went off on a, a whole bunch of other tirades, one of which is so fascinating. I'm going to play it after after her segment. Uh-huh. But, like, I didn't even pick up on it at the time. But on her other show, That Man on Fat Man, I do a bit of a, a rant about stuff. And I think I'm talking about the Joe Rogan show. But I kind of do a little insert about maleness and you know men and it very much ties into what she's talking about yeah and in, in our segment here and it's 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 kind of weird it's yeah. it's like a whole it vibe co-mingled with our show yeah 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 and it was unplanned like mm-hmm. the, one was recorded before the other and like i didn't even pick up on the you know i didn't pick up on it at the time yeah it was all retrospectively so but until then here's uh here's our interview with aaron judge Hi, 
everybody, welcome back to Tales from the Swing. I'm Jean Holden, and I'm here with... I'm Scott Holden. Scott Holden. As usual. Today, we have um, a very um, wonderful feminine guest. Um, her name is Erin Are you Judge drunk now? <laughs> her name we is have Aaron a wonderful, fabulous, <laughs> feminine, feminine <Yeah>. grab her <laughs> by the pussy guest today. Now, um, I first heard her on Keith and the Girl. She's a comedian. She also is a writer. Um, Vow of Celibacy is her book. And um, Aaron, did it come out in August? Is that when you? Yeah, book August came out? 2016. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're here to talk more about her her life and just about maybe a little bit about the book and about your open relationship history. Yeah. Why that. you be on a show like this? Yeah. Why do you want to be on our show? <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys. Hi. I'm Welcome. Aaron. I'm Aaron Judge, and I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, I, you, I, I think that the reason you invited me on this show is because I qualify. You do qualify. <laughs> so you were actually supposed to be our first guest too, but like we just ran into scheduling problems. Right. Yeah, but the uh, I like that now I'm the feminine guest because <laughs> well, I've been no. called feminine zero times ever before. Really? In my life. I guess it really depends on what your baseline for comparison is. Right. But yes, if you, I mean, I am a, I am, I am feminine and female identified right. and all that fun stuff. Well, to me, you're feminine. That's what I label you as. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I receive your label. Oh, thank you. See, girls, <laughs> girls can do this. I, I, I can't even, you know, I don't even understand what's going on in this conversation now. Well, feminine like encompasses a whole, diff- whole bunch. Yeah, you of guys things, are in a whole feeling vibe whole thing right now. And- Right. I guess I'm in brick. I'm just so, in brick wall phase. So what I'd like to hear is just um, about what, like, how you came about the polyamory. Yeah, how'd you figure out you were? Yeah, yeah you were wanted to be in open relationships or polyamorous or what do you? What would you say or you identify as? Identify as, yeah. I really like the, the label open. I prefer open. Yeah, but I do too. Poly yeah. is actually probably more applicable because I am in like multiple simultaneous relationships. Okay. I guess it's just right now um, polyamorous. Like there's there's a way in which that term I've seen it get conflated with like a sexual orientation for a lot of people. Like people are like, oh, I didn't realize that people could be born polyamorous, and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like it's a choice and it's, uh, it's you know, I mean, they're like, we're hopefully going to talk later about people's different levels of sexual interest and all that other stuff. But I do, I mean, I do kind of feel like it's just, it's a decision that I've made that I'm comfortable with. It's right. not like being bisexual, which I, I am, and I did not choose that. It's just <laughs> what I am, you know? Right. Yeah, 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 I agree. Those things are very distinct in my mind and uh, I kind of, I like open because it, you know, it sometimes leads to follow up questions, which I think are actually kind of necessary because everybody's situation is unique. And I think that there's, you know, in with any terminology, when you introduce this concept to people and for most people, it really is pretty new or they've only heard like sensationalized versions of it. They, you know, they need more information because everybody is kind of doing it differently. Right. Yeah, it's very much so. Right. Well, first, I want to actually. Right off the bat, the way you say that you feel like Polly is becoming, and then you like paused and you're like, mm, I kind of feel like that too, but I feel like Polly is becoming conflated with one guy, two girls. Really? Yeah, it seems like that. Like whenever, and, and, and like that's Polly and, and that's sort of okay. Or like that's, it's becoming... In, maybe it's just the outsider's mind as that's what a polyamorous relationship is. Right. And it may yeah, be wow. because of the news, because of certain celebrities, that's the way they, you know, like it was, you know, two girls and a guy in a relationship or whatever. And that's because, but that's what it feels like right now. That's becoming in the public consciousness the definition of polyamorous. Really? Yeah, which is wrong because polyamorous really yeah. is. You know, multi. You know, right. it can it can be so many different ways. Right. Just like well, open I, can be so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the the issue with polyamorous is also like it almost feels compulsory. Like, okay, you're poly. Like, tell me all your people. Like, what are your stats? You know, like <laughs> it's got to be more than one because it's poly. Yeah. Right. Like, 
I feel like open is like, um, or non non monogamous is a mouthful, but yeah. poly. <laughs> but I like, like that too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. But I, I think, yeah, because non monogamous, if I wasn't married, I would say that I was non monogamous. Yeah. Monomena. But no, sorry. yeah, <laughs> that is, yeah, my comedian actually <laughs> used that pun on Conan O'Brien's show. You should check out that set. Sometime. Oh, yeah. Well, he was our first cast, actually. Yeah. Of course he was. Mike yeah. <laughs> of course he was. Did we have to say he had, it? He filled in for you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. He had that's to hold great. down the fort. Yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's a really close friend of mine. But Aww. he is, um, he, his yeah, his monomena joke is a, is a good one. But the, the whole terminology <laughs> issue is is truly like this ugh, quagmire, I guess, because it's it's not like every behavior, every decision. It's it's just basically like I don't believe in monogamy for myself. That's I mean that's what it boils down to. Me too. Me too. I I, I kind of feel like my feelings of monogamy are we're setting ourselves up for this bar. As humans, we're setting ourselves up for a bar, an ideal that we just can't meet. And we're always going to fail. Right. And then we're going to destroy relationships over it, you know. And it, it, I just, I, there are other alternatives, right. you know what I mean? Well, and people are told that that's the normal. Yeah, well, you're presented, society, right. you know, shows you a certain social norm, or at least it did. Right. I mean, I was born in 1970, so... And I know you were as well, right. Dean. Mm -hmm. So, like, we were presented a certain reality wherein you're gonna you're gonna marry someone from the opposite sex, and you're gonna you're gonna have babies, and you're gonna live happily ever after. Hopefully, have babies, except for all these people that get divorced, and except for you know all these other ex uh, oh oh there's gay people. Well, right. What do we do about them? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's there's there's no real clear thing except that I think that the expectation. Of male monogamy. I mean, we live in a very patriarchal society. Oh my God! Yes, yes. we do. And, and I think that the uh, and I think that that you know what you're saying about the public consciousness of polyamorous as being one dude and two girls. That's a problem because yeah. like yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of like a lot of multi partner situations are very patriarchal and worldwide and historically. But I think that there was like zero expectation deep down of actual monogamy from men until like maybe the eighties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's true. Like, I think there, you know, this idea that there's like this unstated behavior of men um, that either <laughs> happens before they're married or happens during their marriage with like women of lesser social stature or, you know, well, the women like, the binary woman, right. the Madonna or the whore. Right. And you you can marry people. one type of girl yeah. and you fuck another type of girl. Right. Yeah, or however many of those that you want to. <laughs> and it's and it's the only expectation really was was female monogamy. And really what that means is like not a lot of sex. Like just a sort of low sex existence. Yeah. Wow. Unless you're one of the unless you're one of the other type of ladies, in which case sex is your entire existence and probably your livelihood. Yeah. <laughs> It's so, I mean, point. it's bleak. <laughs> it is bleak. <laughs> it was bleak. It sounds. And, you know, I, it's, I think, you know, and it's not that long ago, is it? No, and I think that that's the way a lot of people live. And I think that that's the way a lot of people perceive of this stuff. Right. And so when you introduce the idea of non-monogamy or polyamory or open relationships, they see something very patriarchal. They're like, oh, so my man can just fuck whoever he wants and I'm supposed to just accept it. <laughs> you know? yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. sad. Yeah. It's sad because that's not that's not the, for lack of a better word, orientation from which I come at it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, there is a lot of that that, like, we were talking in one of the questions and during I'm not sure if it was the first or second show, but it was like, aren't you just trying to get laid? You know what I mean? That that sort of argument of you know is is this is polyamorous really a thing or is my guy just trying to oh he's trying fuck to have sex around. with another girl yeah and, he just wants to fuck another I guess girl. both. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's like, yeah. What's wrong with trying to get laid? Like, let's let's break that down. Exactly. <laughs> there's nothing. There's there's still this idea that having sex with someone is treating them like a dirty Kleenex on some level, and like <laughs> that it has to go. Like, there's you know. But I mean, only it's, again, uh, it's so funny how how much this taps into mis the misogyny of the society of society and as a bisexual male i can kind of i'm like a day walker i can you know i can walk between the yeah. worlds and see it from both <laughs> sides 
God, yeah. I'm an Italian day walker. I'm sure. a because I'm adopted but raised Italian, in an Italian household. You're Italian bisexual. So, day but I don't walker. look Italian at all. Yeah. So I'm an Italian bisexual day walker. <laughs> Just call that's me quite a combo. Call me the gay blade. <laughs> the gay blade. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is. It is. It is really tied into like the. I think anti-sex attitudes are inherently kind of misogynist. You know. But Hem, like, yeah, Hemda nailed it. She's uh, when we were on. She was on. They were on. Our other show. Right. And that's what sort of te- touched all this off because they kind of forced us out on their show, on well, our they show. They didn't force on... us. It was like the. It was yeah, like we the... just started talking about it. Yeah. They Whatever. Asked... They are really good at forcing The microphone. Us. <laughs> the yeah, microphone... well, they, they eased it out. Yeah, the microphone has some <laughs> yeah. sort of drug in it. Yeah, it really does. It's yeah, true. It's, serum. It's, yeah. They, they, pump, they, help, they pump the place full of like truth juice. They do. And... <laughs> but it wasn't until she said the point that, you know, what is it about. Because bisexual women, you know, they get a pass. It, you know, it's a, like I, I say ver- very frequently in the swinger slash whatever you want to call it community. Yeah. You know, all women should be bisexual and all men invisible. Yeah. You know, Cause that's the mm-hmm. that's the ideal from that misogynist point. Now, is that is that what you like your experience has been? Is that what you're saying, Scott? Yeah. Well, well that's what I see out there. Right. Well, that, that's what I've experienced. Right. But what did what did Hemda say? Like, oh, I'm she said that, that it's about. I'm sorry, it's about the feminine. <laughs> it's about the feminine aspect of the man. It's once the guy becomes, so much, yeah. you know, any way womanly, a receiver of, a cocksucker, a whatever, then he is feminine, and that is some sort of verboten, you know, like that's when it becomes, you know. Get this out it of here. It becomes wrong. Yeah, because, and, it's, yeah. and it's almost worse than women right. because, oh, my God, you're a guy and you're acting womanly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that there's there's a lot of fear around because masculinity is so constructed and so, like, like I the way that I always think of it is in terms of, like, how constructed it is, is, I've never heard a woman in my entire life ever say, you know, I'm so grateful to my aunt. She taught me what it means to be a woman. <laughs> you know, like, like she taught me. Oh my like, god, it's so true. I've never this even coach, thought of that. That's brilliant. The coach that I had, she taught me what it means to be a woman. But like men say that stuff all the time. They do. Like my dad he taught, taught me, me what it meant to be a man. It's like, and what? And usually, means, what that is is disgusting. It's something yeah, abhorrent. But- and really limiting, you know. It Very means limiting. don't cry, don't feel feelings, right. don't be afraid ever. Like, you know, so, it means a lot of really negative things. Uh, boys don't cry. About and, a limitation around what it means to be sufficiently masculine. Yeah. And, honorable. and I feel like we're at a time now where it's getting worse. You know, like that ideal. That false ideal is being pushed on men so that, like, I find I run into a lot of men nowadays who are like two dimensional, you know, cookie cutter carbon copies of some stereotype. I know. Yeah. You know what I mean? They have, and it's like, dude, you've chosen this ignorance. You realize, I mean, you aspire to this. Well, Well, I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of consciousness raising out there available to young men, even if they want it. Like they kind of have to seek it out and it's it can be tough. Like there's a lot more information for a young, frustrated man about like why feminism is the problem for them than there is like why expectations of masculinity is the problem for them. (laughs) You're fucking right. Especially with fake news. It's much easier to come by. And like, you know, young men are full of hormones and things and impulses that they feel a lot of shame around. Yeah. And I don't think that that's like, yeah. I think that when they ultimately are like, you know what, I'm fine. I'm a dignified person. And I have like, when they get really angry and turn into kind of like micro misogynists, it's because they've been given no explanation for any of that, except their own like biological doomed fate of being bad. Like, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember talking to somebody who's a uh, man who's close to me talked about, you know, having dreams about like sexual dreams about classmates in middle school and how guilty he would feel and how and how like absolutely disgusting and like that he was violating them. And then he just wouldn't speak to them anymore, Aww. you know. And I mean, when you think about when we become kind of homosocial in like middle school, 
you know, I can see a lot of that being in the negotiation for the boy's brain. It's just like, what am I doing in my sleep? That's like, what's wrong with me that right. I feel this way towards this person who is my friend? Right. Yeah, it's so weird. I mean, man, I, we, I mean, I grew up, we went to high school in the 80s, man. And it was that weird world of like, faggot was still a very popular term right. you know what sure. I mean? back in the 80s i went to high school in texas in the late 90s so it was basically everywhere else uh, in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> that's brilliant uh, <laughs> so yeah no i know oh my god Which, where in texas plano texas north dallas suburbs okay so okay. not like austin where it doesn't really matter no <laughs> it mattered <laughs> although i mean hey austin is going to be affected by that abortion bill just like everywhere else uh, yeah. Isn't that disgusting? Gosh. Yeah. Well. But anyway, um, where were we? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that in terms of like calling it an open relationship for me, like the the follow up questions that I want to answer are just sort of about like yeah. what what does it mean to know like in my heart that I don't really jive with monogamy, right? You know, something that I've just sort of felt for a long time and known about myself, and like I'm in a. 13 year relationship and we've been open since the beginning. You know, yeah. there was no, I, I'm fortunate in that there was no like midstream negotiation of that because I think that that is really hard for people to manage, you know, kind of like us. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, when personal crisis is thrust upon you, usually yeah. that's when you, you know, it's shit or get off the pot. Yeah. It was basically, yeah. well, with us, it was, we knew it and it was, we were both we like, became very, well, yeah, we get, we, we, we met, we into... met, we were crazy kids, you know, we had a lot of fun. Right. We slept with friends. We did all kinds of crazy things. Right. But then when we got married and we're, we've been married 20 years, but we've been together since 1990. So right, 25 years, 25 years. Right. Uh, so like, then we felt as though, you know, like now we have to be a certain way. Not that we ever talked about anything like polyamory or even bisexualness. Like we never, re it's just stuff we did. Right. It's, yeah. We, we never really discussed just, anything. And we, uh, yeah. We, to it, us, it was just the normal thing. Yeah. It was just, we were having fun and right. blah, blah, blah. And, but then we felt like we had to live up to societies or our family or whatever. All these things. And it's not like we even discussed that. We just sort of did it. Right. And really? Then... That's so interesting. And so, it... like, you guys you guys were, like, kind of, like, being wild and crazy kids. Then you decided to get married probably because it was time. But was we also – but hang on. We also sobered up around that time. Yeah. Too. So we were, like, So there was party. a lot of, you know, like – We were in, we got into a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We were crazy kids. Right. So we sobered up. And in that process, you know, you go through a lot of – you know, mental health and soul searching. Right. Well, and you do and a lot of, yeah, searching. If you don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, did you 12, 12 steps? Yes, we definitely yes, we 12 did. stepped. We did. Yes, so we... I think that there's a lot of patriarchy in that. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. So there's, and there's a lot Absolutely. of, like, yielding to a powerful God. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's and a lot like, of that. I, I, you know, I mean, it, it, I think that stuff is so hard. And I think it's so admirable when people – do it and when it works for them and when they make it happen in their lives. But I it think that once you've been through it for a little while, you have to reintroduce your own autonomy on it's some so level. True. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. worked for and us for have... a long time. And it did I I would I would encourage anyone who has a serious problem with alcohol or drugs to seek a twelve step group right. to get your shit together. <laughs> to get your shit together and to kind of realize that you have a problem and kind of come yeah. to your own on that. And and now I, that said, at one point I was like Johnny AA, you know what I mean? But sure. as time went on, some of that, spe you know, I remember all my scorecards read zero. Right. The bottom had dropped out of our lives and I was doing all the things they say to do, going to meetings, talking about blah, blah, blah. And guess what? Shit wasn't getting better. Yeah, and my <laughs> you know insides, I mean? like my insides, like I'm not, like my insides aren't happy. Like I'm not Yeah, happy yeah, I was, yeah, life wasn't. Well, you can appear all you want to be happy, but inside, you know, the truth, yeah. you know, what was going on. You know, on. I think that that's like, there was a recent book, I think called change or die. And it was about a clinic for people and like rich dudes, rich dudes in their middle age phase of life who have serious heart disease. Right. So they are like, it's like, okay, look, dude, you're super sick. Your heart is real messed up. If you don't like stop eating animal protein and stop eating fat and stop like drinking or smoking at all. Like even just a little bit, even if you're not super hardcore into it, you are going to die. Your heart is going to give out. Right. 
And these are like people who run companies and are like among the most wealthy and, you know, presumed powerful people in the world. The alpha male types. Yeah. And they can't force themselves to change. Wow. So, you know, when you're in a situation with like addiction or something where you're like on the cusp of self-destruction or hurting other people, right. you know, you need something really radical yeah. that like will get you to change. Yes, right. very people, much so. It's so hard. It's, it it's, is. It, you, like our will is not as powerful as like our capitalist mythos believes it to be, yep, you know? Yep. And, <laughs> and the windows are so small. Those, those, yeah. those moments of clarity, those, yeah. those things. Those moments of Those clarity. are very small. So if there's not something there, the thought of AA, the, you know, you're yeah. kind of fucked. <laughs> like a little twinkle, like, wow, there is a chance. Yeah. Like you have to, like, yeah. the, and if you grab it, like, I know I did. I like grabbed that little bit and that's all it took for me. Now other people may take a little bit more, but it took just that little bit of hope. And that was it. And yeah. I yeah, was that's, able to. That's, that's so good. And that's, it, it seems like you guys really were like at the perfect kind of time and place right. for that yeah. kind of the level of intervention. Right. But like, it doesn't fix your life. It, it does just gets not. You not die. It does. Yes, yes, You're absolutely yes. right yes, to not yes, die. Yes. It's so true. And well, I and not dying allows you, slowly allows you to fix your life. Well, I mean, I, you know, exactly. one day at a time. As they I say. wanted to live more than I wanted to die is pretty much yeah, what, what, yeah. I, what I But is. after a while, you know, like you said, you're in a, this patriarchal sort yeah. of, you know, and there is a certain. It's very patriarchal. It's, the 12 steps are a very interesting set of tools and yes. ones that, that you can use. However, I know that I have to adapt the shit out of them to fit my sensibilities. And I know that I stopped going to church for that reason. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm going to a place that does not share my ideals, right. does not share my va- – why am I doing this? And I have to, like, yes. pick and choose <laughs> and, like, twist it around to make it sound like something yeah, I – Yeah, and I found myself work. doing that more with AA. Yeah. Gene and I, our relationship was falling apart because, essentially, we were living a lie. You know, we were, we were both, you know, bisexual people – in a fucking, you know, like trying to behave in a way yeah. that really didn't fit us. So then if if all it takes is your husband to come to you and say, I want to fuck dudes. <laughs> that that all That's all it took. And I was like, okay. I mean, like, duh. Well, I don't think I yeah. said I want to fuck dudes. No, I think I said, I, we, need to, we, we, need need, to, we need to open this thing up. We need We're, to do it. Or... And the smart thing was I planned, I had actually scheduled a date with that another couple smart. the next day. That was smart. Because, <laughs> wow. You know, yeah, because I knew that if we didn't take action and start uh, at least try something, like it, because like we had almost got divorced once, and by that I mean we were it lawyered up. It was pretty, a serious deal. Yeah, like we, wow. you know, we had just had an, and this this was more part of the catalyst. And then I love that word. Yeah, and then like you know, after a few months, about three or four months, we real, you know, we, it was one of those like. I'm lonely. Can you come over kind of things? And then like, <laughs> all right, let's give it another chance. Yeah. Oh, so you guys were living separately. Uh, well, we or... were in the same house. Which yeah. Is we, we were doing, we were doing the legal separation. Uh, like I that see. was phase one. It's like, a, a, it's like, an <laughs> like existence. I had had a separate section of the house. It was very uh, weird. It's even more complicated. Weird, yeah. But it's very, fucking odd. Like weird, but also very, like it hurt so bad. Yeah. You're in it's the same all... house. It's very hurt. The whole thing was very, it hurt so bad. Yeah. It's, it's like going against everything that, so anyway, yeah. so so we give decide to give it another shot, but even that, we're on like Tinder hooks for probably a couple of years. Yeah. Then I lose my job oh. in and we were living in Virginia at the time. And I had a real you know, I, I was a you know, in IT. Yeah, you were doing well. Yeah, in uh, corporate IT, you know, yes. Also an environment that does not really fit my values and lifestyle, but I was making good money. <laughs> Yeah, that's. I think that that's pretty normal for the IT department in any major company. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's where all the rejects end up. It's so true. It just, it's like no, the... it's a bunch of people who are just like, I would really rather be with anyone else, but here I am. And I work with these people. It's like it's, the percussion it's... fags, if you know anything about school band, Aww. or like, or like the theater tech. Like you're yeah. the theater tech. Yes, yes, exactly. Company. Like you just want to like run the soundboard and like you know go to the cast party and. Yeah. They and are guys busy trying to make money or whatever, <laughs> and it's guys with pseudo dreams of authority too, because it's like I'll run the network, hoo hoo ha ha ha, as if yeah, like. Yeah, no, I think that if system administrators like realized how powerful they were, like they could they could run the place, but they refuse to band together. <laughs> so like, there's like too much of a too much of an individualism, like Ayn Rand type streak in the group, but oh, yeah. like 
it is honestly like one of the most powerful professions on earth. And it's so weird I, that they keep them white Edward collar. Snowden. Edward Snowden, right? You know, oh, yeah, like, fucking a. He changed the world. Yeah, being. he did. And, 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 and he wasn't even like a very high level tech. No. <laughs> that was the weird part of he's it. He's like me. He's about he's about my level of tech. Based on the, so the movie much, I've seen and shit. You have so much access to people's information. Yeah, you know, yeah. you have so much access to the entire company's information. And you have to in order to like make it flow. And there are people who rely on that who have no idea. And you're right about the white collar thing. Like but, it's because it's, it's that's those, why they keep it white collar so they can keep those guys under wraps, under their and, thumb, and so that they can professionalize it and therefore keep any kind of union. Yes, from at yes. bay. Because if there's any group that really should have, have a, a union, union it should be it's them. tech workers. Absolutely. Yeah, but no, know, they might not want them though. Don't say that they now. They don't because it's it's a it's a it's an individual perception thing. I think right. there's a lot of people who are like, I am. A special unicorn. <laughs> that's an inherent thing about my thinking about myself. And therefore, I would never join a union because that's for people who are, you know, group people. Yeah. So are you a unicorn? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know a few of those, though. Me too. <laughs> it's so funny. Unicorns. Like, I mean, the term unicorn within, like, the, the whole poly world and open world is a really is a really funny one to me. It's also leaked out. Right. Should we explain yeah. it to everyone, it, it, what that means? Uh, they yeah. not know. Tr- traditionally, a unicorn is a bisexual female who's truly unattached and available to your couple. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, or like, I, I always heard it as somebody who wants to have sex with the couple that each person is equally interested in. Like, that there's no imbalance. Yeah. Like, there's right. not, it's not like one person's like, sure, I'll be there, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll hang out. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's this thing where, like, um, there's so many ways in which I feel like my main responsibility as a married person in an open relationship is to just sort of make sure people know that I, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in using them. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that it's not... It's like I as much as I am all for people like I want people to be sex positive, but I know that we live in a society that isn't very sex positive. True. So that ren- that lends itself to people feeling bad about them. Like, I feel like I I would never like have sex with somebody that I didn't disclose that I was married to. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, neither would we. We would never We yeah. like like we have you know personal ads or whatever. And yeah, that's very that's stipulated that we don't want to be involved with anyone who's, you know, com, you know, married in, in infidelity. If they're involved yeah. in well, infidelity, oh yeah, whatever. cheating. Because I do think I do think that when you when you're dealing with a situation where like you're very far along in any kind of process of like awakening and like other people are attracted to that and they're like, I am interested in what you have, but I'm right. not willing to to sacrifice what i think i have to it's like outing people right, right. Yeah, exactly like, it's exactly it's, still, it's it's 2016 and you, gay marriage is legal in all 50 states and it's still a sh- shit move and you can't out people yeah I you mean, know here's a, like yeah. people have to make that choice for themselves yeah. people are dealing with it like i have a i have a in my book there's a character who you know in the 21st century in like the 2010s is closeted and she like you don't really hear it from her perspective you see it from the person who's like her girlfriend essentially who she will not own up to you know she will not take out in public she will not introduce to anybody uh, yes. you know she's keeping her a secret she and and the this is the protagonist that's in this situation and she's really like what is wrong with you like it is 2000 you know it, we can get married right and this person is just not there yet you know and it's unclear whether she'll ever get there because that's the that's the scary thing about that liminal space it's like what you guys were saying about those moments of clarity, like people can get really close to stepping through the looking glass and never make it through. Yeah. You know, I know. it's, yeah. it's a huge leap of faith with so many changes that people right. make in life. Yeah. Right. It's huge. And I think that when you're, when you're trying to, you can, there's a great video. Like, you know, remember the, it gets better movement Yes. with like all the videos. So the, the nation of Canada made and it gets better (laughs) (laughs) we have to see this oh yeah that's like 20 minute thing where like many of their celebrities that are gay and like sports stars and stuff are and politicians are talking about coming out Mm -hmm. and every single one of them feels abject terror 
And then they come out and they they edit it together in this way where everybody's sort of going through their phase of being in the closet. And then everybody's sort of talking about their phase of like about to come out. Then they all come out and some of them get disowned and some of them, their parents are like, oh, yeah, we already knew that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in both cases, the people are like, and then after that, my life started. It's so true. it doesn't really matter how it's received or how it. Oh, exactly. It's, it's very true. It's very true. Because it's about you. You're, right. you're going to feel terror when you do this. Right. Because it's about you. That's 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 what it, it's like. We felt like in telling people and we chose to finally come out when they when the Supreme Court said, yeah, you know, gay marriage is OK. We we're like, you know, all right, let's start telling people we're bisexual. I mean, our friends knew and shit, right. but we didn't talk about it on our show. We didn't. But so we decided to come out then. And we feel like we got the reaction of who cares, you know? Sure. But sure. we Thanks do. That's the point. Yeah. We care. Exactly. We care. And Yeah, and it's about authenticity, right? Like, it's yes. about, like, being seen for who you are. Yeah, which is, when you were saying before, you would think, you know, certain things are still sort of taboo. There's gay marriage. So, like, when I meet someone for the first time, I'm introduced to them just even as a basic social setting i really don't feel it's out of line for me to go so are you gay or straight or bi what's your story because you know it it tells the whole thing about a person you know what i mean like what's your sexual orientation but that's still out of line to ask yeah i mean it it is it is a thing where i think different people have different levels of desire to reveal themselves and right. i also am lucky to know a lot of people who i think are super like as a stand-up comedian i know people like mike kaplan who are very comfortable with who they are and very vocal about it and then i know a bunch of people who are very comfortable with who they are but aren't really interested in sharing that with anybody. Yeah, right. there's yeah. a kind of like there's a kind of deep introversion and a deep like self-acceptance that comes with that yeah. and my my spouse is like that you know and i i don't like he's not a person who has shame. He's a person who has privacy. And for my personal, like, let me tell you all of my life story into a microphone orientation. <laughs> is, <laughs> like, I don't care about privacy. Yeah, we've come and, to that space right, too. I don't now. either, though. I just think it's and, important for people to see different ways of living and different like enjoyments and stuff. I just don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, I'm a huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share that with people. Yeah. I'm happy to be like, this is me. Right. But like, I no, really I believe as a, a bisexual male, privacy. I am obligated to do that at this point because we are closeted like nobody because we're everywhere and we're in denial and it's just a group that is misunderstood and misaligned and is so afraid to come out and we need to because if we don't we're never going to be seen we're as popular in society as bisexual females you know how i know this go look at craigslist There's also research. I mean, there's Absolutely. there's re- Kinsey's research from the 50s said that, like, it was way more likely for men to have had same sex. Uh, no sexual shit. Experiences. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, like, look at the Romans. I mean, most guys, not, most, yeah. most guys, that is their first experience, but they don't want to admit it. Sure. Mo- and, and most that's, and this is masturbation curiosity. I'm sorry. Sure. And I, I think that that stuff is, I mean, sex is sexual, you know, like, no. <laughs> it's really not like a big mystery. And we have this lie fed to us that most people are either straight or gay. Yeah. And or that that straightness is natural and gayness is an aberration. And right. anything in between is probably some sort of transitional phase. And it's like, oh, yes. the truth is more like most people have sexual experiences or experiences of arousal at everything. And the funny thing is bisexual, if you look at the actual behavior of bisexual men and bisexual women, they tend to be the same. Most of the time, if you look, to, look at them, they have sort of a primary opposite sex relationship. But they also have had you know, uh, same-sex partners throughout their history. 
Yeah. And I think that that's probably got a lot to do with like society and availability. Right. I went to a women's college and there was a lot of people who probably never would have kissed girls if they didn't go to a women's college who kissed girls at college. I don't know if that's necessarily 100% <laughs> true because I think, I think in a lot of liberal arts colleges, people do same sex experimentation yeah. or yeah. whatever yeah. you want to call it. Right. They have, well, they I have think in your twenties, most people do. But in my, at my college, people would like have girlfriends who I think would never have girlfriends. And like, as, as proves out, like, never have girlfriends again after college. <laughs> but what are the, the things chasing that Amy's of the world, if you will? Yeah, sure. But one of the things that's really interesting is you go into out of that world and into like the lesbian scene and it is really different. You know, uh -huh. like it's like suddenly everybody's making some sort of bold choice about who they are to be there. They're signifying who they are with like haircuts and like behaviors and ways of being and labels that you just don't have in a place where like it's all women and it's fine mm -hmm. you know like are, people are like are you femme like I love how femme you are or whatever and I'm like I'm just me <laughs> never, you know and like you know that was me I said that yeah. <laughs> that's Jean's idea of a compliment <laughs> People would look at me and my college girlfriend and they would be like, which one of you is the boy? Oh, give me a break. But really, like, I, I mean, it's this it's this question where just people don't have they're like, oh, well, you know, there's that's part of why when people think that straightness is natural, <laughs> that is obviously going to be their first question is like okay in same-sex relationships which one's the boy and which one's the girl yeah you know because, because they think that that's the way nature has ordained that people are and so people with this weird mutation that makes them gay are going to be <laughs> that's a weird mutation <laughs> well yeah. my dad taught me to be a man and he said that no. <laughs> well he did teach you to shave right <laughs> oh boy what does that mean since i'm bi I don't know. I who don't taught know. me to be a man I don't know. But that's, that, that's the thing is like, <laughs> you know, we all have to uh, see uh, once you see people as people and like that is a way of approaching them sexually, like and, re and in with intimacy, it's a it's a huge shift. Like I can't relate to being straight or being gay. You know? Yeah, it's, I can kind of get that. It's hard. I mean, I, I can relate to being gay insofar as like knowing that you have a secret that is about yourself and wanting to like, you know, knowing that you have same sex attraction and feeling a lot of fear and anxiety about that, that I can relate to. Yes. Right. Yes. But like, but like the idea where like an entire gender of people, like, especially in 21st century America, where there are lots of people who are androgynous or who are uh, non-binary and and like being like I'm not into that I'm into this. I don't I'd like it's hard for me to wrap my brain around. How about this? Uh, we talked about this last week of the show. Just want to throw this out there. All right, in the LGBTQ com community now, the you know the one LGBTQA. How do you feel about the asexuals jumping in here? And is that even a type? It's not a. You know, it's I mean, not an orientation. I, I see. Though. I argue that. Yeah. I. I, why, I don't think there was a comedian on Keith and the girl who's like, "Why do we get them?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "That. Well, that is so that? perfect." Who I can't was that? Do you remember? I can't remember. Oh my God, that was so funny. Uh, yeah. he, I believe why do we he, get he was them? A, he's a drag queen. I know that. <laughs> oh, I so think funny. that like sexual minorities are grouped together, <laughs> but like, what does that even mean? Yeah, I know because when you talk <laughs> to asexual. Minority. It's, you know, like there, because like there's like it's there's LGBT traditionally, right? So it's lesbians, bisexuals, and uh, gay men, and then transgender people who are just like who could be straight. You know, like true, yes. Once they transition, sure, yeah, yeah. or or whatever. Like you but, know, they've been the way that they've been their whole lives, and the they might be uh, straight. They might have been socialized or raised as a straight man and then they're actually a lesbian woman so then they're the lgb with the rest of us but like a trans person who <laughs> wow you're even arguing to dump the tea no i'm not <laughs> arguing to dump anybody i, I don't want to dump anybody. I hear no, 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 no. Oh, no, trust me i ranted a, last week about the a's <laughs> it's such a left turn away from the other three letters, right? It's true. That's right. Like, I'd say that, uh, and, and I think that that's great. Like, I am all for trans rights, but it's, it, and like for us as the LGBTQ, et cetera, community fighting for those and advocating for those and being allies for those, 
but it is a, it's it's so confusing to but, straight people. But I kind of get that, that though we, because we put that in there, you know. Hey, but hang on, listen, because we, you know, we we have some trans friends, and one of them sort of pointed out to us that you know, just in conversing, she was like, you know, try as I here's the truth, try as I may, I'm never ever going to be a woman completely because I just you know I wasn't born that way, so. But I think she's a woman, you know. Yeah, no, like, no, I no. Mean, she under, but she's. So what she says is, but I am trans, you know. Right. I so, think that that's a really interesting moment that we're having, and I I would love to hear trans voices on this more me too. because there are people who I think are trans identified, and they're like, I'm trans, and then there yeah. are people who are who are identified with their transition gender, you know, and they're like, I'm a woman, I'm a man. Well, yeah, they say, and, well, I'm trans woman, I'm trans ma- if male, you know, however. And I can right. get that. Sure, but I think that those are different things in some <laughs> on some level. Like, I mean, I know children who are transitioned. How would they ever know what it's like to not be the gender that they've transitioned to? Who, would, tra- who would transition a uh, child? Some people do because they feel like the kid is not comfortable with what Kids they tell were. you. Right. Yeah, the kid, kid knows. Like it's kind of like a, it's like it's like how do you know if your kid wants to play the guitar? You'll figure it out because he'll play the fucking guitar. Right. <laughs> you exactly. know what I mean? And, and when you when you uh, like when you, the children that I've seen be transitioned, like it's it's on it's their choice, and right. they are not. It is not like a. It is it is a d- decision that parents make to allow their child to be to thrive. Right. Well, yeah, if to the child there. is choosing, then I yeah. see that as them supporting the child. I don't see that there's as the parents. No, there no, yeah, there's no I don't there's no cases of people being like I've decided yeah, that for Yeah, boy, for, no. yeah, that's what it sounded like. I'm like these kids no. are being forcefully transitioned. No, 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 no. no. These, these these are very I mean the 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 community who is advocating for this is extremely child it's about child safety. Right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. And right. that's fine. I there, mean, if yeah. developmentally the child is, you know, telling you, yeah, yeah. that I get. But I, I, for a minute there, in my mind, the I... Is, like, you know, if that child is five or ten or whatever, wow, like, that's, that's so going to be their entire adolescent experience. Wow. So, you know, it's it's going to be different than yeah. being fifty a 50-year-old person who's lived your life in a male body and finally saying, I'm a woman. Yeah. And wow. how... How you will be perceived by society is yeah. going to be different. Yeah, How huge is that that a 10-year-old could go to their parents and say, I don't feel right. I'm a boy or a girl. It's wonderful. What yeah. a I mean, wonderful I, thing. I and how? So, I think, Here's the other I mean, wonderful thing. The they, safe, they're finding that the surgery saves lives, right, essentially. Right. And the safe environment. They're, because they don't go through years and years of mental, right. you know, it's, well, it is a safer treatment. Th- that is way more to me. I'm thinking of like the safe environment that child has to be able to do that. Like what a wonderful, it's wonderful environment! It's so, it's so refreshing. I love that because a lot of parents don't have that open communication with their kids. It's like pushed down so far. But now you got yeah. these asexuals, and they want to push their way into this <laughs> game now. <laughs> and they asexual. don't even like. You know, I said, as I summed it up last last know. week, these people—they're not asexuals. They're just frigid. They're I just know. wet blankets. They're just no fun. That's mm. fine. Well, Go be okay, no okay, fun okay. somewhere there's, else. There's, but there's a couple things, right? Like there's like. There is repression and there is sex negativity in our society. But I think that with people that I've read, um, I don't actually know anybody personally who identifies as asexual that I know of. But the people that I've read, what they're saying is like, look, this is a society that's really saturated in sex and sexual interest. And I, as somebody who doesn't really feel that way and gets really uncomfortable when people think that that's what I want with them and from them. I don't know how to be. They feel just as sort of freakish as the rest of us. You know, like there's an alienation that comes from being um, asexual or like just not having a sex drive. Right. Or feeling like there's something wrong with you. Not having a sex drive is, is, you know, I understand that. But that's really what that is to me. It's not, it's not a whole new gender type. You know what I mean? It's, It's like trans is sort of another gender type. If you so choose, because they're somewhere, there's someone who's transitioning in between. Right. But well, and there are this people is... who are like, I'm non-binary, and that's where I'm going to stay. I'm neither a man or a woman, and I'm staying right there, you know? And uh, Gender fluid. Right. That's fine. Yeah. I, I get I, that, too. But I, I, I think that this is the thing, is if you say any of these categories, including asexual, isn't real, I can tell you how any of these categories isn't real. 
you know like it's it's like what is identity you know like who is the who is the patient zero who is the perfect bisexual who i was gonna say as a bisexual i would be very quick to agree with you that they're really you know as much as people like to think that there's gay and straight i don't even think that there is you know, I, I think, I think so- you know it's that it's like there's a speedometer and where your pin where your needle pins is usually about where you are and then the rest of the time you can float so i mean any of these categories including bisexuality like it's like what what does it mean everybody who identifies with it has a different take on what it means I, I, I bisexual is just so fucking confused as a community they have 1500 words for themselves well, and we don't have a community. That's, you know? I know. Like, agree. Community. There's not even you solidarity can't... among bisexual women and, and bisexual men. I was talking about this last week. I feel like, as a bisexual male, I feel looked down upon by bisexual females. Why? Oh, really? Yeah. You know like, I have, I have experienced. A, I, a, a, sure. I have sure experienced it. I have experienced I have experienced bisexual women who look down there like... Ew, bisexual male? What's wrong with you? See, I don't... That kind of shit. I don't sure. They don't say it, but, you know, you could in their attitude, they say it. Yeah. Why do you think that is, though? I have no idea. That's what I don't understand. It's. I think it goes back to this feminization of women. I don't get that, though, because why is that? You're a cocksucker, them? and therefore, you are a fag. Well, I mean, I think that it's more... It's probably... I mean, there there are... Millions of women, many of them straight, who want nothing more than to be with a gay man. Like, to me. Really? World. Is that not like, the oh truth? God. Yeah, course. there's like an entire romance genre for women oh. that's M to M. Like one of the biggest like genres of romance that like straight housewives read is men like r- love stories between gay boys because they yes. want the unattainable. Maybe, but I think it's also like there's a gentleness there's perceived a sweetness and a femininity it. perceived, really like you were is. saying, and a sweetness, and also, I don't, I don't know. I haven't. I need to interview people who are into. This and it's stuff. hot. Here's okay? the question. Let me ask you this: <laughs> D- Does watching two men make out turn turn you on? I think that it has to be like if it's two dudes greased up and like a gay club with the lights and the uns uns and they're you know shaved and they have a very gay male aesthetic from the contemporary way that that is happening. Like I was on a gay cruise ship working as a comedian and these, wow. these people, the people on the ship were like very uninterested in me and like <sighs> talking to me, looking at me, seeing me, they were just sort of like, let's, uh, they were there and they, <laughs> like, God bless them. They had an agenda and like, they, <laughs> they, they, I was not like, it was not an erotic space that I felt <laughs> Right. anything for personally it was a deeply sexually charged place that didn't do it for me yeah, like yeah, walking yeah. through like i'm not into snm bdsm so like if i walk through like a sex dungeon i'm like or like see that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm like not really affected by it <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, run yeah. through really not quick yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like that's but but if there's like a like a straightish leaning dude who's like discovering his attraction to men and he starts kissing a dude yeah that's hot that is hot right see here we, it took about... a long way to get you there but here's the thing i think again i feel like this is a taboo among women to admit that they get turned on by watching two guys making out but guys have no problem and even women have no problem telling you they love watching lesbian porn you see what i'm saying but, 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 but. women i mean you, like this is the most fascinating thing to me in the world, but uh-huh. women are turned on by everything. <sighs> they much. just don't tell you. No, there's like it, like they don't know. So like, there's this, there's a okay. So <laughs> women, study women are they, like, sex. They showed they put they put you know electrodes or whatever they use to measure sexual response on women's bodies, and we're like, okay, tell us which of these things you respond to. And they would give them sexual images and non-sexual images. And some of the sexual images were, like, very, very crazy stuff. You know, like people having sex with horses or whatever. Oh, yeah. BDSM. And, um, the women, every single sexual image gave them some sort of sexual response in their bodies, no matter what they said. Wow. Whether they were into it or not. And the and I don't know, like, a lot of science and research like this can gets debunked later on. But if this is true, it makes some level of evolutionary sense that you – you go through your sexual response as a female because that protects your birth canal. Yeah. As soon as you like have a sexual response, totally. if a sexual situation is coming at you, even if it's a violent one, even if it's one you're not into, you protect your birth canal. 
Right. Otherwise you can puncture it in that situation. Wow. So, so it makes, so they were basically saying like, yeah, women are turned on by everything by some measure of turned on. That is like about the female equivalent of whether you have a boner. Yeah, titillated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, but like men are pretty much aligned with what they say. They say that they're into something or not. And you can tell by their blood flow that they are, <laughs> that their brain and their genitals are kind of lined up. Oh, yes. Wow. But women, not so concrete. Like, no. Wow. And but so they're turned on by everything is what pretty you're saying. Pretty much. Yeah. It, but, but for, for one definition thereof, right? And then what happens in our brains is really different. You yeah, know, like women... basically a woman's willingness to engage in sexuality doesn't have as much to do with her sexual response. So true. Yeah. As, it's you know, wild. and like setting up that context for people, like where they experience arousal in like a nice slow, like I think, I think a lot of young women and maybe even women in their twenties and thirties have just never been aroused. Yeah. I would like to really? encourage all men out there to do yourself a favor and cross dress at least once. Interesting. Yeah. Because oh. like, I remember when Jean dressed me up oh, and took some pictures, the experience, the insight I gained into femininity, a little bit of femininity was amazing because what you learn is women are sex. Guys want sex. Women are sex. That's why they think about and, it all a lot. And for women, foreplay starts literally with getting dressed. It really does. And it's like everything about women is sexuality and, and a feminine sexual identity, or at least if you you know, if you're going that way, which is the way we went for the pictures. Um, so, <laughs> I, but it gave me such insight into the female mind that I never would have had before. And it was such a simple thing to do. Right. But then you just, you get, maybe it's just me, but. I, I love all that. Like putting makeup on and all that stuff. Yeah. Especially if you're married, yeah. have your wife dress you up because you really <laughs> can get an idea. Plus you also understand what women go through every day with beauty rituals. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that that's a really interesting perspective because I don't really think that I like that uh, element of being a woman. I've never really enjoyed, like I, I don't like to sexualize myself in that way. My, my, uh, I think that the most sort of masculine thing about me is that I really don't like to get hit on. I really like to hit on other people. Right. I really like to be the aggressor and I really like to be the person who's setting the, like I, I'm the one who puts myself out there. Right. It's like, so hey, I'm into you. Are are we doing this? You know. <laughs> and if somebody approaches me, even now, like I mean, I've been, you know, I am really. I've been at this whole open relationship thing for a long time. If somebody approaches me and is like, hey, do you want to get with me? I'm almost like, whoa. You know, like I still kind of have this, this like, negative response to that. And that's just always been my way. And so, like, it's a sort of desire to seduce, but from what is historically constructed as a masculine angle. Right. Um, I want to set the agenda. I want to take the risk, you know, of saying, I, you know, I want this. Do you want this? Right. Because um, you're really and, putting yourself out there when you do that. Yeah. Absolutely right. And I, I, I like that. Yeah. And so... I don't know what that is about me. It's one of those things that I think is probably more about personality. Um, and I, I accept that about myself. I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's interesting. It's really kind of hard for me to absorb other people's flirtation or sexual energy. Now, when, have you had times really? when you That's did weird. that, that you were like, Ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Oop, I used the W word. Forgive me. No, I'm weird. That's fine. Uh, the, no, it's amazing how fast you realize that's a bad word, <laughs> especially yeah, in this or community. Like, or like, yeah, it means like that is incomprehensible to me right now. Uh, I'm condemning you. <laughs> but what, what were you saying, Jean? I no, I was. Um, th now, have you had any situation where you did um, go up to someone or tell them I'm I'm really interested, and it was a negative? A negative response. Shot to down. That. Like oh, shot down. Oh, or... oh yeah. Have I been <laughs> shot down? Of well yeah, I'm just I'm just like because it happens and it's not always like, yeah, I'm into you too. Like it's not always a yeah, I'm ready. Well, and I think that I had this like uh this bratty attitude 
for right. a while where I was, I would try to, I would keep trying when somebody was like, oh yeah, no, I, I'm thinking of you more like a friend. I would uh, be like, but well, I'm going to wear you, you down. Know. You look at it more like a challenge. And that is now like something that women are talking about as being like a very dangerous space in their lives. Like somebody who won't take no for an answer. Harassing. And I was, I was on the spectrum of people who were, who didn't, take no very well you know that was like sort of the journey that I had to go on was being somebody who could accept that right as a sure response from somebody and not then like nag them essentially right and uh I think that that's it's a it's a very hard thing to accept because you have to you have to like stop telling yourself in your mind like but I'm picking up different signals You know, like you have to stop, even if it is somebody who's like, maybe they're curious, maybe they're interested, maybe they're in a relationship, but it's not going well. And you kind of see that, like, you just have to take what they say at face value and like be mature. You just have to, you you just have to, I moved on her and I failed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. I did try. She was married. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, and I that moved too. Her like a bitch. But I couldn't get there and she was married. And all of a sudden he I says, see she's now when he says he moved on her like a totally bitch, changed. he's referring to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even I don't even get that, you know? Like I was thinking what is he saying there? He's moved on her like a bitch. Like is he saying he's the bitch or she's the bitch? Yeah, like I don't get it. I don't get the con- or yeah. and and I I think that what he's saying is I moved on her from a position of weakness. Yes. Right. Yes. And she and shot him like, down. I should have come swinging my cock harder. Yes. I don't know what he thinks like yes. about what that means, but he means that he failed because he came weak instead of coming uh, hard. He was more of a bitch than like with a big cock yes. coming out. Yes. Yeah. And it's He's just it's a... just so like that I moved on her like a bitch. That is like, let's do a dissertation on it's sex. <laughs> right. Unpacking every sexist, fucked up, sex negative, mm. patriarchal, uh, anti woman, anti, like, let's anti, like, weak man. Like, let's unpack all that. Right. For mm. like 150 pages. There's only one Tic Tac, the original mouth wag. <laughs> Sorry. That's the Tic Tac commercial. Yes, yeah, so I couldn't resist. Did you say? Did that say mouth whack? Yeah, that it's was an old whack. commercial it's from an the seventies. Then like, they used to go. Yeah, that was double. like the whole ad. And then you have the double whack. Yes, the, t- <laughs> the tic tac double whack pack. <laughs> yeah, we we made a faux commercial <laughs> on the other show, Sli- splicing in little bits of Trump. <laughs> so should we talk a little bit about um, a news story? Ah, uh, I or mean, we, we we, we've to... done fifty eight minutes, so yeah. it's up to you, sir, ma'am. Well, we we could do like we we don't have to. I mean, I could do it. After, well, I mean, we're going to talk about it anyway. We but... can talk about it after. Uh, what are your feelings on sexual addiction? Yeah, do you Me? think? Yeah, yeah, s- sexual addiction. Do you think there's a, a such lot a of, thing? Yeah, uh, there, but there isn't any. Proof. I've always thought it was a cop out for guys who got caught. No, 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 no. There's oh, a lot of no. Kind of like when that guy said a bunch of like homophobic slurs and they made him go to rehab. Remember that? <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. remember who that was. Pray the gay away. Type well, of no, <laughs> pray the gay away. Those are bro- that's what tr- that's what Pence is into. He is he is into yeah. That. But I'm talking about like they like sure. So those things those things those pray the gay away things are ridiculous. But then there are a lot of things like okay, so addiction to substances. There's brain science about mm-hmm. why it messes with you. Like why cocaine is really a bad thing to get into because it rewires your rewards it it mimics your brain's chemistry right and in so doing makes you less dependent on your real chemistry and more dependent on this fake thing right so so when you cut it off it's like i can't feel sorry we have this this thing where something about our brains like certain things that are taboo or forbidden become like highly highly catalytic like they become highly uh they 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 result in extreme arousal you know like i think that's the mechanism for eating disorders and i think that those kinds of problems and, and like sex addiction is like you know it's it's very related to sex taboos you well, know and I the think, thing is too it's yeah. it's easy when it's alcohol or drugs i think but when people say it's an addiction to sex 
it, like an addiction is like a biochemical thing. I, so to me, it depends on the person. Not, okay, aren't... now there are people out there with, for lack of a better term, disorders, who even you know who engage in too much sexual activity and for the wrong, for wrong purposes, okay. if you will. I mean, they're hurting themselves somehow. Right. But, it's done in a hurtful way. Yeah, and the sex isn't more of an act out. There's other shit involved. I mean, you know, it's not... There's more going on upstairs than the sexual right. component. Oh, yeah, it's more of a mental... There's there's mental illness or... Yeah. It's coming out. Like, the sex is what... <laughs> it's coming out in the sex. You are right over basically. there? Was it what? Did we lose you? I, no, I no, thought no, I heard no, groaning I... over there. <laughs> Oh, they're uh-huh. talking about this again. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's a uh, it's it's a uh, it's a really interesting difference, right? Like, I don't know. You were saying that they discovered that sex addiction doesn't have a chemical component. I'd be interested to compare it to like gambling addiction or internet addiction, right? Like, is there some different space that that like where you become compulsively obsessed with something and you can't get it out of your brain and you can't control. You can't easily control or even with like a medium amount of assertive behavior control your ability to not engage in it. And I mean, sexual addiction, I think um, I think I first maybe it was something that was going on in the 70s or whatever, but it was I think big in the sexual, 80s. Yeah, exactly. When we had HIV and AIDS and, scaring and, the hell out of everybody. and cocaine, lots of it. Oh, yeah. No, and like it's a it was a very it was a powder keg. <laughs> <laughs> And, and bathhouses, if I think about it, you know. But it it is it is this sort of like diminishing returns oriented behavior. Like you know, like I think most people fall away from it, and some people can't kick it. But like it's like anything that you do. Like you know, I I reload Facebook too many times, and I want to <laughs> stop, but it's really hard. <laughs> like I wish that that was like not true <laughs> yeah but here's the thing here's what i do know if you were on a plane you'd have no choice and you'd go on you know what i mean you wouldn't I be like go... oh my god i can't refresh my facebook page you know you wouldn't be like jonesing right i don't know like i think that there are people <laughs> who get to that point yeah you know there, i, mean, I agree I there are some the, people the automatic thing if i was working on my laptop Oh, yeah. I would click on my browser icon, even though I couldn't get like I would automatically do behaviors to get me to Facebook that didn't get me there. And I would be like, oh, right, I'm on a plane. But those behaviors would still be automatic. But I think the OK, the behavior or the way the behavior manifests is almost irrelevant. You know what I mean? Like because you could be like shooting people in the ass with a dart gun that could or, you know, whatever. Uh, sure. It, yeah, it's just. There are certain people who are going to have a, a serious, serious compulsivity issues, OCD, right. whatever you want to call it. Sure. Uh, but the substance itself is almost irrelevant, right. I so, think, in those cases. Right. So sex. Yeah, but me uh, going to Facebook is not going to, like, cause me to contract something. Like, you know, if you're, if you're having, like, if you're going on Craigslist and, like, having sex, like, in a car with somebody you don't know – that's unprotected. Yeah, you're you're endangering yourself. Yes, exactly. Agreed. So you know, I mean, like that's if that's a sexual compulsion that you're engaging in, like I can see why you would want a twelve step. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't. You're not necessarily you know, sexual addiction as a disease is recognized by, you know, science. Right. Well, it hasn't. Right. It's just because how can you be compuls? I mean, how can you? I don't know. I I kind of agree. Well, there hasn't been enough tests done on it. There hasn't been enough research. Is what basically what the article, I always I just we always felt about... it was guys who got caught. It's always guys who got caught. No, They're always like, like I am a sexual addict. It's not only guys. It's I mean, a cop no, out. But in the article that we'll talk about, like Anthony Weiner comes up. You remember all the shit with him? Yeah. I mean, and that guy was... clearly cannot control himself. And then no, he whatever. was like on a horse. Like they did all this horse therapy, like trying to get him to not do it anymore. I don't know what. <laughs> But here's the thing. I know. What is that? Like riding a horse. How does that make you not want to do it? I okay. Would think you would... But here's the thing. I don't know. If, if, you, if you become. Weird. Uh, first of all, can I ask, do you at all engage in or dip the toe in or uh, the swinging community, for lack of a better term? Or uh, any familiarity with that? I do not. Okay. I do not. I'm, I'm very interested. I think it sounds really interesting, but it's not something that is like come up. I haven't participated. Right. 
But it's interesting, though, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. I mean, being a bisexual couple that, yeah. you know. Like swinging it, is so. Yeah, we we get in, it. we it's move in that community, but we, but we hate almost all aspects of its of its terminology. Well, it just has it's, like a 70s type yeah, of it's feel. Yeah, so old. But uh, I and think it, people Even use the community it. itself is having, it, you know, there's a definite turn. There's more poly people or people who identify as poly. It's right. all the same shit. That's it the thing. Really it's people who just want to fuck each other. It's just so many. They complicate everything with fucking labels. Right. That's really interesting, right? Like, I think that there's so much armor that goes into our approach to sexuality because there's so much vulnerability. There yeah, is. exactly. You know? Like, exactly. it's this incredibly vulnerable thing. We live in the society where sex on TV is still taboo and extreme violence, like Game of Thrones type stuff, is like fine. And even like, hey, let's not complain. Like, I love Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Don't but you, start, right. don't you take my Game of Thrones away? <laughs> you're more inclined to see sexual scene that is rape than you are to see like an intimate sexy sex scene that goes on for a a while or an intimate gay scene between two men right Right. and so i think that that is that is something that we are like it's still so i mean i i don't know if this is a hundred percent true i've never verified this but some people have told me that i was the first comedian to ever say the word bisexual that i was bisexual on Comedy Central, and that was in 2008. Wow. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that is like, we, when, once you enter into the world where you have self knowledge and you become really steeped in like the information that's available and out there, you don't realize how little other people experience that and how unexposed people are to these ideas and these realities, you oh, know? Lord. Like, it's, and like right now I do a, a comedy show at a romance bookstore in Los Angeles. And I have never been so fascinated by these women and like the people who are the romance community, the writers, the creators, the consumers. It is an incredibly diverse group of mostly heterosexual women, but plenty of queer women as well that are like, this is their sexuality. Yeah. It it is like, it is like the evidence, the, the information straight men claim they need and lack is there for you. Read these books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, read my God. Books. That's exactly they why they can't. Read. You know, like, just, like, come uh... on. Like, you, if you authentically want to come to women on their terms about sexuality and get them interested in sex, go to them. Go to That's where so go to the space true. of their sexual of their sexuality. So true. But again though, I, I think you're only gonna if you're gonna go there, you're only gonna get a certain type of woman. You know what I mean? You're you're gonna get as you know, m- your chances are you're gonna get women who are into romance novels. Yeah, well, well sure, <laughs> but like once you realize what that means and how diverse those women are right. in terms of like every race, every ethnicity, every, you know, it is and every age group, every religious group. That is true, like, because that, that, you know, that book, what was it, a couple of years back, that broke through and they were calling mommy porn. Oh, so ridiculous. Um, 50 Shades. 50, 50 shades. shades. Yeah, there's a yeah. new one coming out too soon. And 50 Shades <laughs> is something where I think a lot of people were experiencing that as being okay for the first time. But I also think, like, the women who own the Ripped Bodice bookstore don't carry that book they can you know and a lot of it is because they feel like there's a lot of non-consensual or manipulative yes stuff in it i've heard that so and then what i've learned about the romance community just from being attached to this bookstore a little bit through my show is that there is a thing called the non-con genre where it's women who like to read about non-consensual sex meaning rape Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. you know and that's a genre of romance that's available to them on the internet and also genre of romance i'm thinking that's not so romance though being exactly and so that like then that's another set of labels that breaks down right you know so some people are like this is this shouldn't be considered romance because it's messed up and other people are like hey i can't control what gets me off you're kink shaming me wow yeah Yeah, i believe yeah what was it it was uh kevin allison who was talking yes to us about you know now in the bds community there's you know uh black people who want a slave experience yeah they and that's sort of like like people are like well you know like it's sort of an upheaval 
within the community itself. Like, right. well, how do we treat this? You know, and there is kink shaming going on and that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, and like I think I think that that space of just like what gets you off is fine. There's like revolution in it, but there's also like with everything, there's a kernel of 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 danger in it. Yeah, that I think is authentic. That I think is not about is about having an experience that like we are not who we are isn't set part of the problem with identity is that it's like okay well by the time you're like a certain age you are who you are and it's just a matter of finding the right labels and coming out that's again, a lie again we tell and telling the world who you are right that's a lie we told ourselves we're, we're plastic we are yeah. so plastic throughout our lives you know yeah. we change yeah that's and shit. constructing an identity can be one of those things that's really limiting to your growth right yeah, and I remember. I feel like what... even people identify with their kinks too hard. Oh yeah. It, like it could be a space where they can't change that. They're later just like, but I'm the guy who really likes to, you know, <laughs> have, have a wear a tail in the bedroom. <laughs> now that I have to keep that as my thing. That's my uh, thing. We gotta have the tail guy over again. I know, really. I'm so <laughs> over oh, the tail. Oh yeah. Can All right, dude. Like, more like. More like Dude, that was so two like, years hey, ago. You're the tail guy. We really need a tail guy. I Can know. Be our tail guy? And he's like, I don't want to be the tail guy. <laughs> uh, I'm the I wear propellers on my nipples guy now. <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of steampunk sexual. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> so true. <laughs> he's goggles. with like a monocle want, and stuff. <laughs> I want you to sit on my face while I'm wearing like a leather air aviators cap. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, okay. Right. But you need the glasses too. <laughs> and the glasses, the yeah. goggles, yeah, everything. The gla- yeah. Yeah, the well, that could be like a um, what's her name? I have a better idea. Amelia Earhart thing. Why don't we dress? <laughs> why don't we dress you up as the Sundance Kid and I'll attack you? Oh yes, you could be Butch Cassidy. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That movie wasn't too. Yeah, good. we watched that the other day, and I was like, oh my god, that man was Robert so. Redford. Fucking Robert Redford hot. was. He was a beautiful man. Both of them were. Paul Newman, too. Yeah, but no. Those Robert eyes. Redford was like a god. Yeah. Yeah. But you would have some people that would um, give you a hard time for that. Because yeah. there's and definitely I don't, Paul And Newman generally, people. not a mustache person. Oh, yeah. He don't, was, don't dig the mustache, but he was rocking the mustache. He man. was that like porn. He had that porn mustache, too. That I would have went for the mustache ride. <laughs> you could ride a horse just like uh, Anthony, Anthony Weiner. Anthony Weiner. <laughs> hey, oh, all I have god. to say is. Wee! <laughs> <laughs> nay, nay, I'm ready. <laughs> Where's my saddle? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that we're all changing all the time and that we all have, like, this very complex set of things that we've taken in throughout our lives of culture and society and religion and all this stuff. And, and we're all, like, these, like, very complicated landscapes internally right. of all that stuff and sexuality is one of the arenas in which we kind of live it the most and uh that can be that can reveal some of the things that we've taken in right and it's fun it sex is fun. is fun i don't know if anyone I, ever told yeah. you this but <laughs> sex, is, sex is fun and i think that one of the greatest gifts of my life like the external like things i couldn't control and didn't necessarily like create for myself that has been bestowed upon me is just like having a very easy breezy sexual relationship with my own body and like with sexuality. Right. You know, like just like being a really like sexually charged up kid in high school and having boyfriends and experimenting and like doing all that stuff was so healthy and good for me. Yeah, It sounds like you were very self-aware very early and, but not shamed full of it because i was self-aware very early but ashamed of it yeah you know what i you mean know, I, have, I have i have so much shame you know okay. i feel like i have so much shame but almost none of it is related to sexuality and i don't know how i dodged that bullet wow see, see no yeah. but mine was definitely sexuality shame yeah you know like, and i think that that's interesting like i feel like some like i'm much more inclined to be ashamed of something that i said mm. like to somebody or something that I wrote on the internet that I'm ashamed that I wrote and it plagues me even after I've apologized, you know, I'm like, Oh, it's there forever. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and then like with sexuality, I think about like, you know, I was thinking about this experience that I had, you know, I was raised Catholic and I was, um, I was an altar girl, which is, was there such a thing? Yeah. I don't remember any altar girls in any of my, my Catholic school. She's younger than us. 
That's true. Yeah, no, it was a new thing, and I was in Texas at the time, and so the Catholic community was smaller, and oh, so yeah. there weren't enough. Like, there was, it was gender equity, equity of necessity, kind of. There weren't yeah, enough gotcha, boys, gotcha. so they had to use the girls. So gotcha. They... But they would never come down to that with priests. No. That'll never happen. No. No, and like there was like there were people in my city that wouldn't go to my church because they had altar girls uh. when like the Pope hadn't specifically said it was okay. Yet. <laughs> but then then he did, and now it is. So okay. that's okay. So they can go back to that church now. He finally said it was okay. My now they God. can. <laughs> you know, religion is insane. <laughs> but I mean, I had this experience. I'm like, I'm a 35 year old nightclub entertainer, polyamorous, bisexual, plus size person. Like I am, I am low shame, right? <laughs> And when I was in fifth grade, I cracked up on the altar. I started giggling, and the priest shamed me, and then a congregant came after and told me how disgusting I was in a way that was, like, the most profound shaming of my life that, like, I still feel it. Isn't that weird? Like, I can still feel the shame because I laughed one time. Right. Yeah. I've had the, I've had a similar you, something happen. I'm pretty sure I school. hate dentistry because I was shamed by a dentist. Really? Oh yeah, like be, you know, as a young kid, like just being reamed out for not brushing my teeth or some shit. Oh my god! And yeah, just... that can be really humiliating because like you're you're in such a vulnerable position, and like this person is criticizing you in this like oh yeah yeah wow. yeah totally. And I've I've always hated dentists, so right there you go. <laughs> See, I had a, know... I had an experience in Catholic school too, and oh. it really hit me because Nuns, nun shaming, shaming because the nuns yeah, because I was an awkward looking kid, and I wore glasses. I stuttered, which it's so is even funny because you are positively hot now. A but... stuttering, awkward looking girl, yep. and she would put me up. She would say, "Okay, Jean, now read the the you know the read this paragraph." I would die up there. What's I would a, die. Like, and what then, kind of no, sadistic fuck? But does listen that? to me. A, she the same same. I will say her name, Sister Florida, the meanest nun ever. She actually, my sister walked in, and she said, "Oh, you must but it be." Makes sense. No, but these are the things that stick. That shame. That you're. Oh, you're a Jean sister. Oh, you're the pretty one. <laughs> but I mean, this is what oh, I mean. These are the God. things that stick in your brain. Well, think about grade. it though. These women are sexually repressed, sure. living these sure. lives. Of, you know. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, but these are the things as a like. I I was trying to like sort through the other day on my own. Like, why do I still feel such deep shame yeah. over this priest? This congregant come because it's a combination of anger and shame yeah but this dude who was like this dude who was like ted cruz like he he could have been it could have been actually ted cruz right came back in the in the church and told me what you did up there was disgusting oh. and he gave me that sort of like like eyebrow like i'm an authoritarian male and i am looking through your soul and telling you that you're a dirty girl yeah you know and i can see who I you really are was yeah. so shamed and, and like it is this thing of just like what does the adult in this situation think that they're contributing right i had a shaming event yep. actually that happened very recently like back in may that ha it, it, it was it's sort of like i didn't even think that there could be this form of shaming oh of yeah people. this is just yeah but it was like a friend of ours died and like it was sudden Right. Yeah. And it was unexpected. And he was important to a lot of people. And he was important to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people knew this guy. And important to the community that our other show is in, right. which is like, like a, a Kevin Smith-based right. show. Not like a huge celebrity, but to us he was very... Yeah. Very <laughs> Ironically, the person who actually told me of his passing was Kevin Smith. Because we we were at a show that night and interacting with him. And we were supposed to film, and then we didn't, but... It, so it like came right from the guy, right from my hero's mouth, and so I did a show on it, and I got all this grief. I got all this shit on the internet that like I was personalizing the tragedy. I essentially got grief shamed. I've never heard, I've experienced that ever, ever. Ever, before. it's like I have. I've seen that. I, I've experienced that. Like have I had you? a friend who died in college and there were people who said that like one of my other friends was like you don't, didn't know her well enough to be upset about this yeah. essentially yeah and it's like so and, what, do, what do you have to do do I have to take out my texts messages to prove that 
I and this person had a relationship, and so therefore I do have a reason to be affected more than you deem it necessary? And it's also this thing of like, I can't imagine myself dying. And if, if somebody who I've never met in my life was like, oh, she meant so much to me and wanted to talk about me for an hour, I wouldn't be like, you know, but people are so messed up about death too, that they yeah. just, that stuff leaks out, you know? Right. And I think that my friend who <coughs> did say this to me, she's my best friend. You know, I think she comes, she came from a culture. She She's a mixed cultural background right and she comes she came at least partly from a culture that she didn't fully grow up in where like any kind of ostentatious display of anything is considered very vain yeah you know and so it was like when i was like okay i want to i want to have openness here i know that i'm a person who's able to speak yeah so i want to be like okay let's talk about this and i you know i'm here for you if you're a person who wants to talk about this or whatever it was and it made her uncomfortable because it made her feel like i was taking i was doing some sort of display for social reasons right. exactly exactly you're yeah exactly because well, not everybody wants to talk about it you're trying to make and, it your tragedy right that's fine and like i i i think that there are so many different responses to grief and and re people who want to push things down right. or people who think that it's private and personal and that you should not display things publicly about it are offended yeah. Absolutely, like, and fundamentally, and you know, it's yeah. we live, man. There's quite a spectrum of <laughs> what people think is right and wrong. And I mean, the craziest thing to me is like I had a family member pass away, and I realized afterwards, like some of the people in my family who were raised by the same people have such different ideas about money and justice from yeah. each other. Yeah, right. Growing up in the same household. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like some people are like, oh, yeah. obviously, this is what's fair to do with money. And other people are like, no, obviously, this is what's fair to do with money. And it's opposites. Right. And yeah, they, yeah, yeah. the same two parents in the same house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah it becomes you know? very. Well, yeah, that's a whole, that's, that's a sticky situation. It's sticky when that, yeah, when, when money becomes involved in that because people don't think the same. Yeah, it's weird. And because, you know, death aside, money is something that we have all these taboos around. So, Absolutely. like, there's oh, sex, yeah. there's money. That that show on NPR, Sex, Death, Money, yes. is great. It's great because she's nailed it. Like, right. those are these spheres in which people don't want to talk about. Stuff. That is a very good show. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. True. Very true. Do we, are we even, I think we should, we've gone for like an hour and 22 minutes. Yeah, I think we're. I, we're... I don't think we need to do the person, getting personal at this point. We've pretty much gotten personal. Yeah, we have gotten personal. With <laughs> we could actually have you on again. I don't feel like we, we still don't, I, I kind of want to get, I would love to get a vibe for how you kind of work your if you will, dating habits or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Would you come on again? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Awesome. This was really fun. <laughs> this oh, was great. a lot of fun. Yes. This is, I feel like, you know, we're getting a dialogue going and right. hopefully people out there will start getting their dialogues going. Well, and it's still yeah. fresh and new and we just want to kind of share it with the world. Share it with the world. It's, it's, absolutely. And let everyone know it's okay. Yes. There are options other than monogamy. Right. And you can try it. It's okay to try it. Yes. Yeah, and my non-monogamous life is very, very idyllic. You know, it's not perfect, but I like know. it's great. But it's so much so, better. You know, and I really want people to see that like my marriage is really safe and sound and successful, and my other relationship that is like with my girlfriend is really wonderful right. and like really a great relationship, and we've been together for almost four years. Right. That's great. And you, you have know? the ability to do both, and it's and it works. Oh my god. <laughs> You mean you mean you didn't empty out your love bucket? Yeah. On only Oh, my <laughs> love bucket overflowing. <laughs> Isn't that, it, it was so but fun. It's the true. first I love that because it's so inevitably that comes up in sort of polyamorous discussions, but they, they ever someone always goes to the bottle of love example, you know. I only have so much love in my bottle or so much sex or so and if I give it out, I, I can only give it to one person. No, you you're you're actively giving that out to many people every day. Right. Absolutely. I mean, the, the real bottle is time. We do have a finite amount of time. Yeah, that's true. But, so, you know, in terms of energy, love, all that stuff, nope. Yeah. Man, now that I think about it, the, the energy that is exerted in just getting dates together. <laughs> the oh energy God. that is exerted in repressing your sexuality yes, is pretty that too. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, here's the interesting thing, though. I think that most general sexual repression is there for the reason of making it more exciting. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I do I do think that when everything goes, it's like a little bit like, 
huh, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like almost like bag. you build like in the kink. Tastes good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would, I would think that that's why, you know, there's, in cultures, they want to cover women completely. You know, it's, I mean, that's an extreme. But, you know, cover it up. So when you uncover, it's like, oh, my God, you know? Yeah, the Victorian ankle boner. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. You just took me back to shop class. Dig this. Wait, wait, wait. I got to tell you. Because I was in shop class in high school. And we had this old fucking shop teacher. Of course, was missing pieces of finger. Oh, my God. And <laughs> but he that's a prerequisite. But so I brought like my father had a boot jack, and so there was like a th- you know you had to make a project, and I don't want what's to. a boot jack thing? exactly. It's a thing that you use, you step on, and you oh. put, and it like helps you get your boot off. Oh, those so are you from you put your days. heel. In. Yeah. So he showed us one, but it had this <laughs> this ninety degree angle piece of wood on it, and. We we're like, what's that for? He's like, that is so no dirty cad could dare see her ankle. Wow. Mm. Yeah, it was an ankle guard. That dirty Old 1800s. Cat. That dirty cad. Boot jack. <laughs> wow. Like an ankle boner. Wow. <laughs> That's so ankle funny. boner. You just took me back. It's like I hadn't even heard. Like those two things never came now, in contact with my brain. But did that click with you back then? Did you know what he meant? Well, I get. I mean, I he explained that back then, you know, like women would wear so much, you know, garb that really the only thing ever exposed was the ankle. Yeah. And ooh, you know, if that's have, the only thing exposed, you right. don't see my ankle. Yeah, I don't want anybody Do re- seeing mine. <laughs> Do you realize that? <laughs> I have cankles, so. You want to hear something weird? You know, <laughs> you know, spats. You know why those are there? Yeah. You know what spats are for? Cover your foot in some way? No, or your ankle? they cover your shoes. So most people think they're to protect right. you, but they're actually for some reason to protect, keep your socks clean. That tells you how anal they were in the 1800s. Wow. <laughs> Laundry Spats. was revolutionized by the washing machine. Like <laughs> <laughs> everything else, like it's just like you got to keep everything as clean as possible for as long as possible because right. laundry takes all day and it's once a month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the good old days. I know. That's like the good um, old days. Remember when we could forget people's birthdays? Now you can't because Facebook. Sucks. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. We want to thank right, you guys. so much for being on the show. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much, too. It's, I was, so much it's such a pleasure. And I will. I would love to come back and actually maybe spill some tea about my life. Oh, <laughs> cool. yes. And if you're ever in the New York, you know, New Jersey area, maybe we can get you in the house. Yeah. That'd be great. I, I I should be there in the in the spring, sometime in April. Cool. Okay. Cool. Awesome. awesome. We'd love to have you in. Great. Thank you guys so much. Love to meet you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Have a great day. You See too. you later. Bye, Aaron. Bye bye. Aaron Judge, everybody. Well, that was awesome. Yeah, she was Talking a great guest. To Aaron. Yeah, she I is... can't wait to get her back in because yeah. like I feel like we barely scratched the surface. I know. There's so much more. Like I'm intrigued and yeah, yeah, yeah. learn more about her. And yeah, yeah. Because it seems like so far, everyone's sort of style has been different than ours. Right. So it's it's interesting learning the different styles that people uh, practice. I want to um, put all of our stuff out there because we yeah yeah yeah, during yeah the we, interview we were remiss. Yeah, we were. And we were actually having such a great conversation yeah. that it felt like one of those. All right, I'll see you. Okay, it just was like a friend. See yeah, ya, talk yeah. to you soon. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, so obviously you can get her at Erin Judge mm-hmm. on Twitter. And um, she her book came out in August. It's Vow of Celibacy. And yes. on Twitter- it's, it's a novel. It's at the Vow of Celibacy. Um, and she's an awesome comedian writer. So yeah, so uh, check her check out her online. Out. Well, she's also mm-hmm. at Erin, I think she's at, sorry. She's AaronJudge.com as well. Yes, so AaronJudge.com. Go online, check out her site, yeah. check out her books. See check her, out like, her tour dates, I'm sure. See where her dates are, exactly. Yeah. Go, go see her, support her. Yep, she's over And uh, hey, you never know, you might get lucky. She's Polly. She's, ah! <laughs> she's, a, she's a Cali. <laughs> yes. She's a Cali gal. Yes, but she gets out here. So, so She does. Because she's a you know, comedian. Right. So... Moving on. Oh, no, 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 no. Because I want to. Oh, you I, I, have I, your yes. thing. Wait, yes. Wait, wait, wait. Before we move away. Yes. Now, this is what I found interesting. And this was, you know, oh unplanned, but just something <laughs> I noticed that this is, I said this, 
the day before on the show, uh, on our, our other show, That Man on Fat Man. And the context is I was just talking about Joe Rogan and the right. sort of machismo that seems to be permeating oh, a lot yeah. of the uh, the the population right now. I don't get I don't understand what happened to people in this. Something like Trumpism ties into it, taps into it. Right. But it's more than that. It, it's it's the MMA. It's the NASCAR. It's the wrestling. It's the there is a certain, there's this concept of what a guy is right. in that See, circle. It's like what Aaron Judge was saying. She's yeah. like, no one ever had to teach me how to be like, a woman. Right. It's a fucking stereotype. See? Yeah, and and like, it's so fake. That's my oh, point. Totally but it's a fucking stereotype. That's why I was like, oh my God. It's she, a stereotype. She got it right out of the fucking Watermelon yep. and all the other things and that you can think wings. of. The, yeah. <laughs> But oh here's God. the thing. Really say that? <laughs> no, I think we're just trying to be shocking. Are adopting it. They're adapting. The shock. No, I mean, we weren't. No, adapting. it was our, in our point. Right. We yes. were saying those those definitely. things are stupid yeah. and and horrible. Yeah. yeah, that's the point. Yes. I think anyone who with any yes. nuance. But, but then again, if they're these people, they wouldn't have any nuance. Act like right. right. guys yes. can't have it. Pseudo ideal. Uh, what the hell's nuance? Ideal. Which isn't. It's not some French word. It's their ideal. Of what French or fags. You know, it's, it's America. See it's what I mean? all that shit. It's all oh, that... Apostrophe st- M. It's all that stereotypical, ignorant bullshit. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're choosing. So there you have it. That's me talking about the same kind of... Like, I didn't have her vocabulary. The... What is it? Uh... Oh, My daddy taught yeah. me to be a man. Uh-huh. Like, I never thought about that. But, right. yeah, it's so true. But yeah. we're in the same wavelength there. Yeah. Same subject matter. It's very fascinating. Yes. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Yeah. Great conversation. I enjoyed yes. it a lot. So, uh, why don't we get personal? Okay. It's time for Getting Personal. On Tales from the Swing. We're only doing one question. Yeah, today. we're going to do one. This is um, because we had a really long show. Really long show okay. today. Now, this one's from Jennifer. Mm-hmm. And Jennifer asks, How do you know he's sticking to the rules? <laughs> it's always a he. <laughs> now... Well, How do you know she is? Huh? I mean, you could turn. You could wait. Is your mic on? You got to talk into it. You could um, flip it around like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, what do you think? You start. Um, I think that that is a question that you can tell someone who's open and someone who's not. Right. Because. Usually, if you're in, if you've already adapted, you're kind of. There's a lot of jealousy issues, and there's a lot of jealousy, particularly, and insecurity. Uh, that you need to deal with, yeah, to be in this lifestyle. And if you're asking those questions right out the gate, right, then you know, I don't know. What, what I mean, I guess it all depends on what are the rules. If you make the rules real liberal, then then how can you not obey them? Right. <laughs> There's there you go. There's the easiest way to solve that problem. Have but the funny thing is what I think we're going to find most weeks is that the answer is going to be You got to talk about it. I know. You guys got to discuss it. Mm-hmm. And if this is something you really want and you're and you Go to your partner, and they really don't. Then, like on Malcolm, uh, on Blowhard the other week, mm-hmm. you know, you, you got to come to a point where you have to make that decision. And I right. was actually with Malcolm on it. He's like, if they're, you, you didn't hear, the, I don't know if you heard the show or not, but they had yeah. a question of, it's sort of, they had a question if a, if someone, your, your significant other doesn't support your dreams. Oh, yeah. You know, how do you do, or how can, what approach can I use to, to sell her without her prisoner? And Malcolm's approach was, hey, you, maybe you should uh, look look elsewhere, because if someone you're with is not willing to support your dreams, then maybe you're not with the right person. 
Yeah, because your dreams are like who you are, like your passion is who you are. Yeah. That's, so, like your, that's like your substance. If someone out there legitimately has a, a the the urge, the desire, or they know within themselves that they, they're poly inclined or, mm-hmm. you know, open, they, any relationship they want to be in is open. Or if they're in a relationship, they want to open up. You know, talk, talk to the person you're with. Right. Get their feelings. Don't be afraid. Maybe right. they'll be into it. Maybe they won't be. Maybe they'll just be into seeing you happy. Um, Maybe they want to fuck other people too. You never know. My, my, when I think so of I, this. Yeah, the question is, yeah. Yeah, when you're. How, it's how can like, you be sure he's It seems like you're rules. coming into it to, when, you, when your question is like that, it just seems like you're already sort of setting yourself up for failure. Who gives a shit? What do you care? How do you know he's sticking to the rules now? That's even more important. Because I well, bet you anything, there are no rules. If you're unsure, then you need to talk about it. That's the bottom line. Yeah. That's how I look at it. So that, um, that would be my question. How, how does a monogamous if, person know that the other person is sticking to the rules and I'll go one better? How does the monogamous couple even know what the rules are? I guarantee you they barely had the discussion. Right. And maybe some monogamous people are listening and they will have the discussion. Um, or maybe the assumption is, you know, you I can't hope. fuck anybody else. Uh, yeah. you know, or it's, you know, the standard till death do us part. Yeah. But maybe um, people listen and think otherwise. Yeah. Hopefully. Mm. And have more fun. Yeah. Um, but I'm totally you know, shot trust, out. <laughs> trust is the oh. is the number one. I thought you were gonna say trust, shout out. You look tired. I am tired. Yeah, trust yeah, is the number one. Yes. And communication is number two. Yeah, that's so, I, I mean every week I have it's a feeling not, that is gonna be a thing. You, yeah. you gotta start you gotta talk. You gotta be honest. You gotta start opening yes. up about this stuff if you wanna go here. That's why it works so well. Yeah. The communication is key. Yeah. So Well, you never know. Uh, you know we can only talk about what we've experienced yeah. for the most part. But it's uh certainly helped our lives, helped our marriage. We enjoy it. And yeah. uh, we do. And we will see you folks next week. And send any questions. Yes. Oh, yeah. To oh, tales. To tales at Tales from the Swing. Thank you, sweetie. Yeah. And any like comments, questions, whatever. Yeah. And you, or you could tweet stuff to yeah. us. We're on the Twitter. We're at, the Twitter's a little shorter. It's Tales from Swing because we couldn't fit the in there. Yeah. So tail at Tales from Swing. Sorry. <laughs> But otherwise, I'm sure if you typed in Tales from the Swing, you'd see our show yeah. come up. Yeah. Or go and, and find follow us. follow us. Yeah, yep. follow us and subscribe. And hopefully, if you're listening, you're subscribing. Yeah. And send us anything. Yes. Too. Out there on... Like uh, any like like news info you think is And is if you're having cool. trouble hitting the site, it should be all fixed now. So you should be able to get to... Technically, the site is uh, talesfromtheswing.podbean.com. Yes. Oh, yes. But it is. you should be re- rerouted there. You may have had some issues in the last week or so. That was my bad. Sorry. Uh, but otherwise, it should be fixed, fixed, at least temporarily, which will move to a silent, permanent one that you won't see. <laughs> <laughs> a permanent fix you won't notice. All right. Let's get out of here. We hope you enjoyed this week's installment of Tales from the Swing. Come back next week for more fun talk about the open world of, you know, the sex. You know, I don't know what we call it. You know, open world relationships, polyamorous, all the people who are engaging in various alternative uh, relationships, relationships, lifestyle choices. Yeah, absolutely. So. All right. Bye now and bisexual. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye bisexual. Bye guys. <laughs> bye bisexual. <laughs>